Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Shauna Smith along with Dave Braves. Let's get you up to speed with everything that you need to know as the clock hits 3 p.m. Eastern time. A busy week kicked off here with a banking rebound leading stocks higher as first citizens agreeing to buy parts of Silicon Valley Bank. We will look ahead to the Senate hearings over the SVB crisis and whether or not all of this is just the calm before the storm. Plus, Disney beginning the first of three rounds of layoffs this week, set to result in 7,000 job cuts. We'll bring you the details in just a bit. And later, Brian Sazi joining us from Las Vegas. Two big interviews you do not want to miss. He will be live with the CEO of Foot Locker, Mary Dillon, also Pinterest CEO Bill Reddy. That's coming up later on in the program. But first, we got to start with the latest developments out of Disney. CEO Bob Iger announcing the start of mass layoffs this week. The company is cutting a total of 7,000 workers as it looks to slash $5.5 billion in cost. Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal following this story for us. And Ali, what do we know about this first? round of layoffs. So we already knew that these layoffs were coming. This was announced when Disney announced earnings on February 8th, which is why I don't think we saw an immediate reaction to the stock price. But shares are moving a bit higher right now, up about 2%. Now, we did receive an internal memo from Bob Iger, Yahoo Finance obtained that. And we know that there will be three rounds to these cuts. The first round happening this week, the week of March 27th. Second round will be in April. And the third round will be before the beginning of the summer. So Bob by the summer, 7,000 jobs will be eliminated. Now, Iger did warn that for the employees still present at the company, well, there are going to be a lot of challenges ahead. He wrote in part, quote, for our employees who aren't impacted, I want to acknowledge that there will no doubt be challenges ahead as we continue building the structure and functions that will enable us to be successful moving forward. I ask for your continued understanding and collaboration during this time. So a turbulent period overall for this company. And let's not forget, in addition to these layoffs, Disney also restructured the business into three separate units, entertainment, ESPN, park. So when Disney does report earnings next quarter, we will see all three of those segments split and we'll be receiving the details when it comes to revenue subscribers, which I do think an analysts and investors alike are really curious about, especially with ESPN and how sports rights has just ballooned. Yeah, yeah I, I couldn't agree with that more. I really want to get a glimpse being a sports fan of just how much they are contributing to the bottom line there. Obviously Parks we know is, but ESPN needs to be separated yeah. to get a better look under the hood. And I can tell you, everyone over at ESPN, walking on eggshells, just wondering who's going to be next. It's a very tough time because they've been through this before. Uh, the, the whole media sector really is going through a tumultuous time, to use your words. Who else is undergoing a similar transition and what does it tell us about the year ahead? We've really seen this across the board, right? Paramount restructuring its business to combo with Showtime. Warner Brothers Discovery, that is a business that's dealt with multiple merger-related challenges. But in the latest earnings report, CEO David Zaslav said that the bulk of their restructuring is behind them. We've seen Netflix roll out several revenue initiatives, like its uh, crackdown on password sharing, ad-supported. So this is something that all media companies are leaning into right now, this promise that better days are ahead in 2023, that we're going to be seeing these peak losses, and that's because of these layoffs. That's because of these restructuring efforts. So that is really the vibe right now on, on Wall Street in the, within the media landscape. And this comes after 2022. The stock market wiped $500 billion off of the top media and entertainment companies. So we really entered this year kind of not knowing where the future of media would be heading. So all of these CEOs just came out guns hot yeah. saying this is what we need to do moving forward in order to most appease our shareholders and in order to reinstill that investor confidence. And is it headed to big tech? So we've talked about this. Amazon and Apple both spending a billion dollars on movies, both spending on sports, both spending on streaming. So an interesting transitional mm -hmm. year. Allie, thanks. We'll see in just a little bit. All right, let's get you up to speed now on what the Fed is saying about the ongoing banking turmoil. The central bank's vice chair of supervision, Michael Barr, weighing in today, saying that Silicon Valley Bank was a, quote, textbook case of mismanagement. Joining us now to break it all down is Yahoo Finance reporter Jen Schomberger. Jen, nice to see you. What else are we hearing from the Fed? Good afternoon, Dave. Great to see you as well. Tuesday morning, we will hear from the Fed's Vice Chair of Supervision, Michael Barr, 
for the first time on why Silicon Valley Bank failed when he testifies to the Senate Banking Committee. In testimony released earlier this afternoon, Barr says SVB's failure is, quote, a textbook case of mismanagement. He says the bank's management did not effectively manage its interest rate and liquidity risk and that the bank suffered an unexpected run by its uninsured depositors. Quote, the bank waited too long to address its problems, and ironically, the overdue actions it finally took to strengthen its balance sheet sparked the uninsured depositor run that led to the bank's failure. The picture that has emerged thus far shows SVB had inadequate risk management and internal controls that struggled to keep pace with the growth of the bank. Now, Barr admits that regulators spotted the issues leading up to SVB's failure, but said there's certainly a gap as to why those issues weren't addressed. He says it's really up to the bank's management, not the supervisors, the regulators, to fix those issues. Now, we are also hearing from FDIC Chair Martin Grunenberg, who will testify tomorrow before that same panel, and he will say that the FDIC will do a review of the deposit insurance system and will release a report by May 1st, including options for deposit insurance coverage levels and excess deposit insurance. He says the two bank failures also demonstrate the implication that, that banks with assets over $100 million can have for financial stability and that regulation for capital, liquidity, and interest rate risk merits attention. Now, Fed speakers are also weighing in about the impact of SVB on the economy. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari said Sunday recent bank turmoil has increased the risk of a U.S. recession, but said it's unclear what that means for monetary policy. Asked on Sunday during an interview on CBS's Face the Nation if the strains could tip the country into a recession, he said it definitely brings us closer and it's unclear how much the banking stress could lead to a credit crunch that would slow down the economy. Now, Dave, this week we're going to hear from a smattering of Fed speakers, including on Thursday, Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin, Boston's Susan Collins, followed on Friday by New York's uh, Fed President John Williams and Fed Governors Lisa Cook and Chris Waller. Back to you. All right, great stuff. Jen Schomberger there live for us. Thanks so much. Both Michael Barr and Neil Kashkari seem concerned over the U.S. financial system after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. For more on this, we're joined by Vincent Reinhardt, Dreyfus and Mellon, chief economist and former director of the Federal Reserve's Board Division of Monetary Affairs. Good to see you, sir. So let's start there with those comments from Barr that this is uh, typical mismanagement. Is it far more than that, sir? Okay, two parts. The first thing is, who are the Nobel laureates in economics right now? Diamond and Divig, who established that bank runs can matter. And what do you need? A maturity mismatch, deposits that are uninsured, and a trigger like trying to raise capital. SVB fits that textbook perfectly. Third one is Ben Bernanke, who said that a deposit run could lead to financial contagion and that could hit economic activity. That explains the, the response of the, the major regulators trying to contain the damage. What didn't we hear? Any self-blame. Importantly in that mismanagement was being lulled into it by a decade of the short-term interest rate being very low, low and completely inert to invest in longer-term securities. Um, that turned out to be completely inappropriate is the Fed tightened. So part of what's happening right now is a legacy of lower for longer. Well, Vincent, what does all this, though, mean in terms of the risk here to the economy, in terms of the risk of a recession? Kashkari making the case that it raises the risk of a recession. Do you agree? Uh, yes, but you have to pick your starting points. Uh, back in January, uh, people were talking about the recession of 2023. Every major indicator of recession was flaring. Then we got a string of strong data, and if anything, it suggested that the odds of recession had gone down a lot. We, we heard about no recession and soft landing. 
um, what the events of Silicon Valley Bank and the and the run generally have basically trimmed the good news we've heard since January since January and we're back where we started. Chair Powell said that in his press conference last week. Uh, so essentially, where were we in January? We were thinking the Fed would tighten a couple more times and that there would be some risk to the economy, considerable since their forecast was a one percentage point increase in the unemployment rate, uh, something that doesn't happen outside a recession. So we're back, we're back in January. Is the risk of recession higher? Yes, it is higher than when employment re- uh, printed with you know close to 300,000 jobs created, uh, but it's not materially different than where we were in January. I want to circle back quickly to the bar comments. Again, placing all the blame solely on the bank. You recognize, and you just mentioned, the backdrop that the Fed created of a rising uh, rate environment. But what about the Fed's inability to see this coming and to better regulate SVP, SVB? Should they acknowledge that? Uh, so that's why they're doing a report. And so my answer will be a lot like Chair Powell's answer at the press conference, premature uh, to weigh in before we hear the report that the vice chair Barr uh, puts out, uh, recognize uh, that the regulatory and supervisory process is a lot of memo writing. They send warnings to bank, banks and expect banks to, to follow up. An important question for the vice chair, an important question for the FDIC as well, is is how do you make sure banks act on that advice? Uh, that's part of the the, the, the the private sector system we work on. Regulators watch, they advise, but it's up to management to put put meaningful changes in place. It appears that the folks at SVB, at least according to the vice chair, didn't. And Vincent, a lot of people are asking the question what SVB's collapse with the recent comments from Powell at his press conference, what all this means for Fed policy going forward. We asked one of our guests last week, uh, Chris Leonard, about this, about what he thinks it means for Fed policy. I want to play this quick soundbite and then get your reaction on the, on the other side. What Jay Powell is telegraphing, what the entire FOMC is telegraphing, is that we are going to see rates at or around 5% for the rest of 2023. And that is going to have significant, significant, you know, knock on effects in financial markets. It is hard to envision a world where we stay at 5% for the rest of 2023 without having massive downward adjustments in asset markets. Vincent, what do you think is is an appropriate response from the Fed going forward? Is another hike likely on the table? I think they're leaning forward, and and particularly in an environment of considerable uncertainty. They don't know what the neutral funds rate is. They can't fine-tune anything. So the policy design is to put the funds rate into at a level that is meaningfully restrictive and then hold it there until they get evidence that inflation is gone back toward the goal of 2%. For them, that restrictive level is probably a quarter point higher than it, were, than it is right now. So expect another tightening at the May meeting. And they'll hold it there until they're convinced otherwise. And remember, once the central bank stops, they tend to, to linger a while there, just as in the chart you're showing right now. Long period of pause in between policy actions. And that's true if you ran this chart back to the 1950s. Uh, and, and that's where the Fed is because they believe that the financial contagion is, is limited because banks basically are well capitalized. This was... A, relatively unique phenomenon of, a, of, of, of the tech culture, and that the policy response has been pretty vigorous. All right, Vince Reinhardt, always great to get your perspective. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon.
All right, we want to get a quick check on the markets here. 45 minutes to go in the trading day. You're still looking at a mixed picture. This market check sponsored by TC Trade. Dow holding on to gains up 270 points. S&P up just about a half of a percent. But you can see the NASDAQ lagging off just about a tenth of a percent. Technology, the worst performing sector here, as we do see a number of the larger cap tech names and also some of the semis uh, trading to the downside today. But in terms of leadership, some of the financial stocks, some of the bank stocks rebounding today, energy and materials among the leaders in today's trading action. All right, well, we are just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, Yahoo Finance's Brian Sazi sitting down with Foot Locker CEO Mary Dillon to discuss how the company is repositioning or positioning itself given the latest economic uncertainty. Then it's the road ahead for Tesla. Barclays reiterating its overweight rating on the stock. We're going to talk to the analyst behind that call on why he's bullish. And artificial intelligence might be coming for your job. There's a new survey out finding that AI could impact roughly 80% of the U.S. workforce. We'll tell you how just ahead. SVB hearing. Major economic data. And some heavy hitters reporting earnings. It is a busy week in the markets. Here's what you need to know. For the first time, members of Congress will grill top banking regulators over the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Expect leaders from the Fed, FDIC, and Treasury Department to testify on Tuesday and Wednesday as lawmakers try to get to the bottom of why the banks failed. Wall Street will be watching this week for the latest round of economic data. How is the overall economy doing? We'll find out with the latest GDP report, along with inflation and housing numbers. And big-time market movers Walgreens, Carnival Cruise Line, and Lululemon are primed to post their quarterly earnings. We'll get a good look at the consumer with these reports. Yahoo Finance will break down all of these stories. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. You're looking at stocks holding on to gains, at least for the Dow and the S&P. The Dow up 267 points here as we kick off the final hour of trading amid that ongoing volatility in the banking sector. First Citizens deal to buy parts of Silicon Valley Bank. Well, that's helping the market jitters just a bit with a number of the regional stock leaves holding on to gains. Let's talk about it with Joyce Chang, JP Morgan's chair of global research. Joyce, it's good to see you here. So what do you make of the fact that the market has been very resilient given all the chaos and the turmoil playing out within the banking sector? Well, great to be with you. Well, the financial markets here are really signaling that they think that the stress in the U.S. and the European banks will be contained because central banks are willing to use the lender of the last resort tools. So I think the fact that the policymakers have acted quickly, that you already see measures that are um, you know, c- c- being discussed um, you know, in the Congress with solutions coming up, you know, has um, really uh, you know, made this one where the risk of a systemic crisis is not seen as um, actually being that severe. Today's action from First Citizens, does that tell you, does that signal to you stability moving forward and maybe this game of whack-a-mole in the banking sector is over? I don't think that the tensions are going to be resolved that immediately. I mean, we're going to continue to see a tightening in credit standards, a slowing in the growth that really does look like past recession dynamics. And there's also going to be a focus on the commercial real estate market because you have a commercial real estate mortgage debt outstanding that's about $4.4 trillion, and nearly 40% of that is held by U.S. banks. So I think that you know the tensions are still going to be there. The liquidity concerns have been addressed in large part by the policymakers, but the whole issue of the credit losses, the feed through to the real economy, and not to mention, you know, just the, um, you know, like um, ongoing, um, you know, um, scrutiny and regulation that will be forthcoming are all going to continue to weigh on the markets. You referenced commercial real estate, which is really a a concerning sector for many. And Goldman Sachs reports that 80 percent of the bank loans to uh, in commercial real estate are all in the regional banks. What lies ahead for regional banks? I mean, for, for commercial real estate, do you believe? Well, I think that look, the MBS market is at the center of this particular crisis because banks of all size, you know, large banks, regional banks, have hefty agency um, security exposures. So when we take a look at the commercial real estate market, I mean, what we see are maturing loans across the commercial real estate ecosystem that are almost $450 billion this year, and 60% of that is held by banks. So I think that um, you know the CMBS market is more than 20% um, of commercial real 
real estate. There's about 185 billion of that that's exposed to the office market, which is seen as having more vulnerabilities given the high vacancy rates. So I think that you know the first leg of this was the liquidity crisis and what the policymakers could do. But commercial real estate, um, you know, is going to be the next important point of scrutiny, I think, by markets. Let's also talk about what investors have been favoring, given the fact that there's so much uncertainty out there. And we certainly have seen a lot of money been poured into money market funds. When you take a look at some of those recent numbers, it's a strong, it's the highest number that we've seen now in quite some time. What do you make of this move, the fastest right here since COVID? Is this something that investors should be considering? Well, I, I mean, look, uninsured deposits were, you know, seven trillion dollars. Um, so, you know, of the seventeen trillion, seven trillion was, um, you know, basically from um, uninsured. And so, you've had um, a mix of this going to the large G SID banks and also to the money market funds. And I think the market will be looking very much at, um, you know, just are you going to see some resolution, you know, mechanisms as well. So we've had liquidity being addressed, but you still have, um, you know, the fears of, you know, future credit loss resolution mechanisms, um, which parts, which banks could potentially be merged. So I think that you're going to see that some of these um, outflows um, have abated compared to where they were in week one, but we still have that risk of outflows um, continuing. And so I think markets will you know, continue to see these tensions for some time. All right, Joyce Chang, really appreciate that. Thanks so much. Oil futures extending their rebound today after initially falling over the past two weeks amid this ongoing banking crisis. Brent crude and WTI both well in the green today. For more on how the banking uncertainty could impact oil moving forward, we welcome in Dan Dicker, the Energy Word founder. Good to see you, sir. So WTI up well over 5%. Brent bouncing back up more than 4%. Is that because we're seeing some stability or at least apparent stability in the banking sector? Yeah, that's right, Dave. I mean, it's it's kind of always the case that when you have difficulties, wherever they'll show up in credit, they'll show up in derivatives. And when you start wondering, uh, you know, previous guests will talk about mortgages or auto loans. But of course, there is a factor of oil derivatives. And everybody is always wondering who's holding, you know, the line, the, 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 the end of all of these um, extra notes that are floating around in the regional banks and elsewhere. So oil is the one that gets hit uh, probably the hardest when uh, these bank issues or these credit issues, wherever they they come up, uh, you know, start to arise. And uh, yeah, the uh, buyout of SVB gave oil some relief. Now, I don't think it's going to be, you know, a long-term relief. I don't see oil, you know, taking off towards $90 at this point. But I also don't see oil being worth less than $70 either. So. Uh, in in the case right now, I'm you know I'm not sure where to uh, to uh, put my money. I've been I've been telling most of my subscribers that they got to play some defense here, and that the um, you know the contagion from uh, the derivative markets, banking wherever it leads, is not quite done yet. And there's going to be several weeks, if not a couple of months, before we see the rest of this uh, kind of play out. Yeah, Dan, and I know you've been closely tracking maybe some of the technical reasons in terms of where oil is going to trade. You mentioned the fact you don't think it's going below 70. You also don't think it's going shooting right back up to 90. So those technical reasons or what you are watching, what are they so investors really know here what they should also be looking out for? Yeah, and it's kind of hard, Shauna, you know, because this is the kind of, you know, place where we are, where, you know, oil investors have run for the hills. They're not going to get constructive on oil for a long time. But I also cannot make a case fundamentally for oil being much lower than $70 a barrel. I don't see it going back to, to 45 or 50. So when you ask me, you know, what am I doing? Where am I going? What I'm trying to do with, with subscribers, put them in, you know, uh, very solid uh, blue chip dividend paying oil companies that you can write options on top of and kind of maximize a gain. Because now that you have money market funds that are paying upwards of four and a half percent, you know, you really have to try and maximize what you're getting from stock investments. And, and so, um, again, long term, I find oil to be uh, very, very strong fundamentally. And so we've got a period of time where we've got to sit and wait. And the, uh, the key to waiting is finding those, those key energy stocks that will continue to deliver alpha in you know whatever forms, whether it's premiums 
or in dividends that will allow you to stay in the game here. And globally, the big news between Saudi Aramco and China, a combined 690,000 barrels of crude a day. Uh, what's the impact there, Dan? It's a big deal. I, I think it's a very big deal. I mean, what's clear is that there hasn't been, this is in response to, you know, global increases in refining capacity, which, you know, haven't happened basically for decades. So we see a big increase going on over the course of the next 18 months in refining capacity. And the Chinese are, are starting to book oil to, to put into those refineries uh, uh, for the future. And again, you know, where is that oil going to come from? Uh, we see a, a, a picture where, uh, for right now, stockpiles are a little bit bloated because we had a, a very mild winter. But those bloats disappear in a hurry if, you know, China gets going again. And the indications, at least from the Chinese, with this kind of deal is that they believe that they're going to get going again rather soon. Dan, do you see it having any real impact on the global price of oil, more specifically here in the U.S., what we could then potentially see? I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't really understand the question, Shona. Can you repeat? Yeah, in terms of the uh, the deal that Saudi Arabia, Saudi Aramco, excuse me, just reached with China in terms of the supply there, do you see that having any impact on, more broadly speaking, on the global price of oil, or having any real impact here in the U.S. or no? Again, it's a, it's another it's another long term function of a marketplace that, to put it, you know, as 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 uh, simply as possible has an endlessly systemic supply problem and a temporarily um, quashed demand issue. So we're waiting for some of these demand issues to move out of the way. Unfortunately, the supply issue can't be fixed so easily. And, and it's that's the kind of thing that the Chinese kind of see. They see a moment when oil is cheap. They can book, you know, long-term barrels at a very, very good price with the Saudis, and they figure they're getting ahead of what's going to be uh, a difficult supply problem. You know, it'll be more than three months down the road. It'll be six months down the road, but they feel it's inevitable, as do I. All right, Dan, good to see you, sir. Dan Dicker, everybody. Come back and see us, my friend. All right, before we head to the break, let's do a quick check of the market, sponsored by Tasty Trade. A solid day for the Dow, up 277 points, nearly 1%. And the S&P has now moved into positive territory, up 20 points. Again, the Nasdaq just barely in the red for the day, but moving in the right direction as we move towards the close. Again, that brought to you by Tasty Trade. When we return, Yahoo Finance's Brian Sazi sits down with Foot Locker CEO Mary Dillon to weigh in on consumer foot traffic, the company's business relationship with Nike, and much more. Stay with us.
All right, joining me now from Shop Talk 2023 is Foot Locker CEO Mary Dillon. Mary, good to see you in person for a change. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I'm going to do, I'm going to try my hardest not to like point to your shoes because your shoes are absolutely amazing. I guess Thank it comes with the brand much. now, right? It comes with the brand now. I'm unlocking my own inner sneaker head, <laughs> which we'll talk about. <laughs> yes, we will. So talk to us. Uh, you're in the business. You're now fully immersed as a new uh, CEO of Foot Locker. What are some observations of the consumer? at this point in the year? Well, I've been in the role now almost seven months. It's gone by so fast because I'm having the time of my life. And what I would say is that I see, I had a lot of hypotheses about opportunities for the company and they've been very much confirmed in the last several months. So we were talking about our lace up plan, which is really pointing towards how we're going to drive long-term profitable growth for the company. And it's about simplifying, investing and growing. Um, and there's you know four different pillars. It's about expanding sneaker culture, which means more sneakers, more occasions, uh, uh, more people in the category. It's about powering up our portfolio. It's about getting closer to the customer through all things digital and becoming a best-in-class omnichannel retailer. True story, I read uh, every 190, 129 pages in that investor presentation. I read every single one. Thank and you I very came much. away, of course. Well, I came away with the, the view that there's a rebranding of Foot Locker going on, better segmentation, yeah. take us through it. Yes, well listen, Foot Locker as a brand is has over 50 years of authentic heritage in street basketball and youth culture. I mean, we are the OG in sneakers. And really refocusing on all things sneakers, relaunching the Foot Locker brand, the kids Foot Locker brand, to drive even more top of mind awareness, more inclusion for all members of the family. And I'm very excited about that. And a, a central part will be really highlighting and celebrating the role of our stripers, and those are the folks in our stores who bring the business to life every day, who have the customer connection, but the best thing is they are sneaker experts. So it's a very differentiated part of the Foot Locker brand. So the Foot Locker brand, sneakerheads, what is the outlook for Champ Sports? How do you reinvigorate that, WSS? Yeah. How do you think about those brands? Yeah, so I'm proud about the fact that we're just simplifying and focusing on the banners that we believe will drive that long-term growth, as well as differentiating them from each other. So you mentioned, I won't get into all this because I could do an hour on consumer it segmentation. Was slides. There was a lot, yeah. but but we have a really great insights about motivation, different motivations that drive you know sneaker buying behavior, and what we're really doing is positioning the banners to best serve those needs. So Foot Locker and Kids Foot Locker really focus on the sneaker maven and the fashion forward expressionist and and active athletes. Champs will be much more focused on the active athlete. Um, and also WSS, we talked about, that's a brand new business that was bought a couple a year or so ago, focused on the Hispanic family. And there's so much tremendous opportunity given the demographic growth in the US of Hispanic shoppers and their buying power. And that Atmos, which is our very special, uh, based on all things Japanese culture and sneaker culture, headquartered in Tokyo with about 35 stores uh, that we're going to really, that's the place that we are at the top of the pyramid as it relates to sneaker culture. Why the 400 store closures? Pardon me? The 400 oh, store closures. Oh, we're optimizing that, you know, listen, we're going to be reducing number of stores, but increasing square footage. We're really stepping back and saying, what's the most powerful way for our portfolio to show up? And that's community stores, which do exceptionally well for us. Those are freestanding, full format stores that really connect into the local community through activation, even celebrating local artists. There's power stores, and what we're doing with those is moving more off mall. So we'll be closing some underperforming stores in some C&D malls, and keeping the A and B stores that are doing great and shifting our portfolio over time to be even more off mall. Why off mall? Why is that a focus? Well, I think I saw that before. Uh, that, you know, just the trends in shopping. I think in general, uh, shoppers are looking for more convenience. So we're used to being able to buy things online and in store. And sometimes the off mall kind of locate shopping centers are just super convenient. But there's plenty of malls that are just incredibly strong as well. I just visited one here today in Las Vegas. And when you're in the right malls and you've got a lot of foot traffic, that's also a great place to be. So for us, it's a balance. Talk to us about some of the relationships. Let me tick through them. Nike, now there's this view, a lot of the analysts that cover Foot Locker, Nike wants to open up its own retail stores. What does that mean for Foot Locker? Well, listen, our relationship with Nike is revitalized. It's, we're really looking forward to growing in the future. By the end of this year, we'll be in a position where we're, we're growing again with Nike. I've spent a ton of time with the team. I'm wearing Nike Air Max 97 today, <laughs> I'm the very Golden jealous. Bullet. I used to have um, a pair of those. And you know, like every great brand and company, I think wanting a relationship direct with their customers is really, of course, uh, important. But in addition, what Foot Locker brings to our brand partners is something that's really special and unique access to a young and diverse consumer, access to people who want to shop both online 
and in person. And in fact, what we see is a lot of people want to shop in a multi-brand environment. So there's a role for retail and there's a role for direct-to-consumer and we just want to participate in both. So you see there, it sounds like you're, you're saying that there is a coexistence. Nike can open up their retail stores and, and you're still going to get their best product. You know what, we're, we're working with our partners at Nike every day to, be, to really build out our future plans. And in fact, we talked about we're going to be celebrating the uh, 25th anniversary of the Air Max, the tuned air, I should say. Uh, we've got a lot of exciting things coming in basketball, um, running. So absolutely very excited about the future relationship. What other brands are surging in your stores that investors may not know about? Well, I'll tell you what's really hot right now is what we call vintage tech running. So it's a brand like New Balance, you know, really reinventing and bringing back so much demand and heat around interest in, in wearing New Balance for just comfort and fashion as well as for running. Um, I would say performance running is really on the move as well. Um, set classic basketball, signature basketball. So again, at Foot Locker, I'm excited about, you know, we did a Lamalo ball tie-in with Puma that was specific, uh, signature for us that did quite well. So all of those categories are really hot, and I would say for me it's about how do we unlock the inner sneaker hat in everybody, because there's various ways that you can build your sneaker wardrobe, which I hope you're starting to do. Yeah. I used to be only in the active athlete category because I'm a runner, but now I also see that you, know, you can expand your entire sneaker wardrobe and find so many occasions to be more comfortable, frankly, and more fashionable. The Fulucker customers, it's econ they're economically sensitive. I go to my local Fulucker and there's a lot of kids there. How are you seeing them shop right now? We're talking about a banking crisis, we're talking about inflation still high. Have you seen any pullback in consumers? Yeah, I'd say it's a balance. I mean, the consumer has been under pressure for a while, since even last summer when inflation started to go up. And, you know, there's additional current pressures around SNAP benefits um, being taken away, around, you know, other aspects of what people are seeing in their lives. But on the other hand, sneakers are an affordable luxury and people make choices. So our customers are choosing this as a category that they want to participate in, but no doubt people are being more choiceful about how they spend their money. Your stock price has gone through the roof since you joined, Mary, and I, I think about it as it's the Mary Dillon premium in, in Full Locker. <laughs> Based on the magic you worked at Alta, does that put more pressure on you to, uh, you have to deliver on these 2026 targets maybe earlier than 2026? Well, listen, I'm, I'm really lucky I've got a great team that has embraced me into the industry, into the business, and we're working together to deliver that kind of exciting algorithm as we go forward. And it won't be easy, like 23 is a reset year. We've been very clear about that. Um, but we're investing in the capabilities that we need to really build the next 50 years of Foot Locker fame, I'll call it. So I'm very excited about that. What is the difference between what you did at Ulta growing that over the course of eight years, uh, expanding the assortment, opening up a lot of stores, and what you're trying to do at Foot Locker. You know, interestingly, in some ways there's similarities. I think beauty and sneakers have similar aspects in terms of engagement as categories. They're categories where you can express your individuality, where newness and innovation all really matter. So in many ways, it's not the exact playbook, but there's many of the similar opportunities to drive great brand partnerships, to really use our data to help drive our brands together with our brand partners, to be, have a loyalty program that we're going to relaunch, and I really believe will be a really key to unlock of some future future growth, as well as to be an even stronger e-commerce marketer. So some of those are similar. I'd say we're just going to get it done faster. I, I apologize, <laughs> I left my sneakers in my hotel room, so I'm wearing Okay, what shoes. is the problem? There are plenty of people with sneakers here, I've noticed, so. <laughs> no, I, I had to tell you, I had to More opportunity. That. All right, <laughs> Philocracy, I'm Mary Dillon. I wish you much success in your new journey at the company. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, thank you so much. And we'll be right back.
It's time for Triple Play. Three stocks that we're watching in the final 30 minutes of trading. We've got Carnival, Roku, and Pinterest. Kicking it off with Carnival, the latest look at consumer spending and also how much of that is being allocated towards travel. We got their earnings results. You can see the stock is now under a tremendous amount of pressure off what nearly 5% here. But it turns out, at least for the latest quarter, that people aren't shying away from sailing the seas. These numbers were pretty solid. Now, Car Carnival ta touting its strong demand, saying that its bookings since the start of the year have, quote, been phenomenal. 2.7 million passengers traveled on the cruise line during its first fiscal quarter. Its occupancy levels more than 90%. But you can see the stock off almost 5% right now, erasing those earlier gains. And that's because of the outlook here from the company. Analysts at both Stiefel and Truist calling the guidance, quote, conservative. But they did note the potential upside later this year. And Ali, I think when you look at a name like Carnival, the revenue numbers, the sales numbers for its most recent quarter were very impressive, up over 170%. And yes, their outlook was just shy of what the street was looking for. But maybe they're giving some room there for an upside surprise. And the stock is also being pressured from fuel costs, from inflation, from currency headwinds. But for me, the big takeaway is just the sheer demand, right? Three years ago, people were getting trapped on these cruise ships because of the pandemic. And I thought maybe the industry is not going to be able to recover, but the demand is clearly there. We've seen that in the airline space. There's a ripple effect here for the cruise lines. Carnival saying it is more than 70% booked through the remainder of the year. And although in the first quarter, uh, occupancy levels remain below pre-pandemic, it is supposed to tick up higher once we get to the summer and that's usually a big season for these cruise lines so looking ahead i do think there are future tailwinds the big question is whether that can offset some of these more near-term risks yeah occupancy was below pre-pandemic but not far it was yeah. at around 90 i think 90 91 percent pre-pandemic so we had many a conversation right here about the cruise lines never recovering because of that post-pandemic perception of being stuck mm -hmm. to your point so I, I was really surprised by the investor reaction, but pleasantly surprised in the earnings call to see a lot of focus on social media and in particular TikTok. So I'm curious to see how they feel about a potential TikTok ban. This is one of my favorite as I check out the Carnival account. You know who that is, guys? Who is that? That oh, is that Shaq. Shaq. That is I Shaq know. captaining a Carnival it's cruise TV. ship. Yeah. It's a fantastic TikTok. One of my, I had no <laughs> idea that he was doing TikToks for them, but it's a tremendous one. They also point out AIDA, A-I-D-A, which is their German subsidiary. That's about 50% of the global uh, cruise market. They have 86 million views on TikTok there. So nice emphasis on social media, on getting, finding a younger audience. But yeah. that TikTok, ban looms over all these corporations starting to utilize it. Yeah, affecting all of these companies. Uh, moving on to my play, it is Roku. Shares are moving to the upside today, up about 3.5%, jumping on the heels of a new upgrade at Susquehanna. Analysts boosting shares to positive from neutral, writing, quote, long-term drivers remain in play while near-term business fundamentals appear to be bottoming. Those long-term drivers include continued success in the connected TV market, with Roku also benefiting from the secular shift of linear budgets. Susquehanna also noting uh, the opportunity for this company is still in front of them, although there are persistent risks in the ad market, at least in the short term. We heard from media investment company Magna slightly cutting their growth forecast for 2023 U.S. advertising to 3.4 percent, down from the prior 3.7 percent, given those macroeconomic challenges that we've seen. But Magna did point out that there are some positive trends, especially around ad-supported streaming, the recovery of the auto industry, with Susquehanna also predicting an improvement through the current quarter after a tough end to the year. So guys, it seems like the word on the street here is that Roku is in a solid position to really balance those risks versus the potential rewards. Really curious to see how these televisions have done. This is the first time when we have the upcoming quarterly numbers that we'll get to see a glimpse at their own TVs that they are now selling in Best Buy, both ranges. There's the low end, the small TVs all the way up to the big dogs to $1,200. And what you're hearing out there in the market is two weeks after they debuted at CES in January, they were already dramatically marked down inside Best Buy stores, giving you a pretty good glimpse at the lack of demand. Probably really bad timing, guys, to debut a television in January with yeah. consumers beginning to cut back. So I'll be curious to see how that impacts the upcoming earnings. 
doesn't look like a positive impact. No, it doesn't look like a positive impact at all, especially because the expectations for that equipment, for some of the product uh, innovations that they had been unveiling over the last couple of months were part of the reason why some of the other analysts on the street had upgraded Roku over the last several weeks. Bank of America last month, I believe, issued a double upgrade for this stock. They were bullish in part here because of the product diversification and what they were putting out here on the market. So if that doesn't hold up, we could see maybe potentially a couple of downgrades. But I don't know. Roku is one of those names. It is There is certain reason to be optimistic mm -hmm. given the weakness that we had seen in the name. But even those ad numbers there, yes, we are starting to see our expectation here for growth in the second half of the year, but only at three and a half percent, which I think you can view as slightly disappointing in yeah. some aspects. Yeah. They did get the TV out right before the Super Bowl, so perhaps okay, maybe there was a boost there. That's always a purchases. smart move. All right, my play is Pinterest shares on the move after an upgrade from UBS on Monday, citing, quote, improving advertising trends. Analyst Lloyd Walmsley raised their rating to buy from neutral and increased the price target to 35 from 27. That implies more than 25% upside in the stock. Walmsley adding, quote, advertisers tell us Pinterest is taking bolder steps and moving more rapidly under its new CEO, Bill Reddy, which gives us more confidence in the likelihood of execution overall. By the way, Reddy will be Brian Sazi's guest live later in the show from Shop Talk in Las Vegas. As for Pinterest shares, they have been the beneficiary of ongoing talks of that, yes, TikTok ban. They're up, uh, let's see, about 2.5% today and more than 15% year to date. We've talked often about who will benefit from a TikTok ban, which I've said repeatedly will not happen. Congress will not move. But if they do, if they prove me wrong, certainly Pinterest will benefit here, Sean. Yeah, certainly Pinterest would be one of those names. It's been amazing to, for me to see just in terms of the lack of user growth in this name, because I think Pinterest is great in terms of resources, has such an opportunity here opportunity out there to convert some of their collages that they are so well known for into product purchases. And they haven't been able to monetize that as quickly or to the degree that I think a lot of people on the street would like them to under the new CEO ready. They have made a, a tremendous amount of cha uh, changes. He has laid out a certainly an, a turnaround plan, I guess you can say here for the company. So a lot of people a little bit more optimistic. I think there's huge opportunity. They just need to capitalize that. And they also need to post stronger growth numbers because it was just yeah. what up about 4%. That opportunity was quarter. a good year or two ago. It doesn't seem I like they're know. pouncing they, on the e-commerce yeah. e e opportunity that was there, still is. Yeah. But you got to pivot a little quicker yeah, than that. Yeah, they should have. Yeah, I agree. And, and I do think it's interesting to see how the stock has continued to outperform. You said up 15% yeah. year to date. On the year, it's up 10%. And since the announcement of Ready's takeover in June, it's up 42%. So investors clearly echoing this confidence that we're hearing elsewhere. But we'll see if they can ca really capitalize on those opportunities. Yep. And we will hear from Ready next hour about what exactly is in store here for the company. All right. Well, it's out with the old and in with with the new, we are going to tell you how Twitter plans on phasing out its old verification program on the other side of the break.
Is Elon Musk setting us all up for an April Fool's joke, or is Twitter going to follow through and take away your blue check mark unless you pay up? Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley is here with more. Dan, good to see you. So they're worth $20 billion, less than half of what Elon paid $44 billion. Presumably this is how he's going to make up at least some of that gap if it's successful. Tell us what we need to know. That's right, Dave. This is part of their effort to kind of right the ship uh, that, you know, seems to be kind of just buoying along somehow. The the valuation, as you said, has been cut to 20 billion. That's based, based on uh, shares that employees are going to be getting or, or will be uh, have gotten. Uh, and so that is down from the 44 billion that Elon Musk had spent on it when he originally purchased the platform. Or uh, he slashed the workforce. He's cut different features, uh, or or uh, is putting different features behind paywalls, and that's where uh, we get this new Twitter blue uh, and check mark requirement. So if you have a check mark now on April first, it will go away unless you subscribe to Twitter blue, uh, and that's where you'll be able to get the the check mark. You'll get two factor authentication via text message. Uh, you'll be able to do things like write tweets. Uh, that are longer than normal, edit tweets up to five times within a certain window. So these are all the features that are coming with Twitter Blue. That that really doesn't, I mean, to me, seem like something that I'm going to pay for, though. I mean, look, I, I use Twitter because I have to, because I'm a journalist and I have to see what the breaking news is. I never use it in my personal life. Uh, I have no desire to whatsoever. Um, and, you know, I mean, as far as other social media platforms go, um, I had to delete TikTok because it was just too addicting. Uh, and I use Instagram. That's pretty much it. I think, you know, if you talk to most people, I have one friend that uses Twitter. I'm shocked that he uses Twitter and he's not in journalism. So, you know, I, I think that kind of speaks to the, the uphill battle that Elon Musk is going to have getting people to subscribe. Now, businesses, if they do sign up for Twitter Blue for that check mark, it will cost them a lot more. It'll be about $1,000 for it. Uh, and he could make up some revenue there. But look, there they're still kind of dealing with uh, the advertisers that had fled when he initially took over. People not sure how the company would end up being run or or what kind of people would be on the platform. Uh, and so, you know, this is a company that really does feel like it's it's just kind of floating along, trying to figure out where it's going to get its footing. Uh, but the way Elon Musk portrays it is everything's hunky dory. Yeah, and Dan, I think you're feeling well. A lot of Yahoo Finance viewers feel the same way about potentially paying because we put a poll out on Twitter asking whether or not people would pay for Twitter Blue, pay $84 a year or $8 a month if they were going to pay to keep that check mark. Nearly 70%, over two thirds, saying no, they will not. So you got to ask how successful maybe this plan is going to be or won't be actually here. For Twitter, Dan, when you take a look at the future of Twitter, so you got this, lots of questions just about what the company needs to do to increase their revenue, to increase their revenue streams here going forward. Also, the fact that Musk did suggest that the company is worth about half of what he paid for it. What does that future look like then for the company? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's really up in the air, right? You know, there's been talk of potentially turning Twitter into an everything app similar to China's WeChat uh, you know, maybe being a kind of commerce platform, you know, there's all these different conversations that, that have come up as to where this app could go, more video, more photos, uh, you know, it just doesn't feel like it's going in that direction at this point, really, you know, I mean, the, the main social media apps that people talk about now are TikTok, Instagram, Snap, you know, it's never really about Twitter being one of those big names. And it just feels as though we're not getting to the point or, or moving towards a point where it's going to be one of those. Now, you know, look, Elon Musk did what he did with Tesla, did what he did with uh, SpaceX. Um, maybe he'll be able to do the same thing with Twitter. It, you, you never know. Uh, but for now, it just feels as though the future is more of the same of what we already have. And, you know, it already wasn't a super appealing app to a ton of people. Uh, you can see that uh, evidenced by the fact that it just doesn't have nearly as many users as something like Facebook or Instagram. Um, so, you know, I just don't necessarily see what the future is for Twitter from here. Yeah, and it's interesting. We talk about so many apps that are potential beneficiaries of a TikTok ban. Nobody mentions Twitter because it really doesn't stand to benefit in any market where there is no real comparison to the content on TikTok and the content on Twitter. So another uh, piece of bad news there for Elon. Dan Halley, thanks so much. Appreciate that. All right, coming up, we're counting down to the closing bell on Wall Street. Stay with us here on Yahoo Finance Live.
We're just minutes away from the closing bell. That's time to bring in Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery to break down the market action. Hello, sir. Hello, and uh, this is kind of a reminder of 2022 last year, uh, not in terms of the dismal trading, but leadership. You see the Nasdaq lagging. It is down half a percent, but the Dow is up half a percent, and it's that dichotomy that kind of defined trading last year. So we'll have to see if it continues, but interesting developments in the bond market say it might continue for a short period of time. I'm writing about this, so look at it for it in your inbox tomorrow morning. But for now, energy and financials, the value trade, biggest, uh, biggest traders of the day here. And then the cyclicals can't leave them out. You got industrials, materials as well, and then staples in healthcare. Two defensive state, uh, sectors are rounding out the top line there. By the way, what's in the red? Tech, communication services, and real estate. So if you take a look at the NASDAQ 100, not surprisingly, a lot more red than green. And real quickly, if you look at the Dow, more green than red, absent those two big red squares to the left, which are tech, of course. Um, Want to take a look at the market leaders as well with under a minute to go. Regional banks in the forefront. Uh, those are up 1%. Some of those concerns over uh, continued banking panics are subsiding, and that is very good news. You can see a lot of movement in the regional bank sector. We've been talking about this quite a bit. Want to look at energy, too, because the demand picture for petroleum and gasoline also picking up with some of those fears abating. And we can see Exxon up 2%. Uh, ConocoPhillips also up 2 Shell and BP up 2 There you go. All right, that does it for today's trading day. Again, you're looking at a mixed picture. The Nasdaq closing in the red. Some of the pressure from some of those larger cap tech names. Also the chip stocks that have been leading to the downside for today. But the Dow and S&P holding on to gains off the highs of the day, though. The Dow up just around 195 points. Energy, a clear outperformer in today's trading action. You're looking at Exxon up just over 2%. Shell up over 2% as well. And Chevron closing up just about 1%. This market check sponsored by... By Tasty Trade. Let's also take a look at where some of the regional banks closed the day. And this comes after First Citizen Bank's purchase of Silicon Valley Bank's deposits and loans at a $16.5 billion discount. First Citizens Bank rising on that news share, soaring just over 50% today. You're looking at First Republic up just about 12%. PAC West up about 3.5% today. Bank of America. Also, the outperform there of the larger U.S. bank names closing up just over 5%. So some relief that we're seeing in the banking sector on the heels of this news and reassuring some of the skeptical investors out there who have been a little bit worried about the turmoil and the stress that we have been seeing in the banking sector over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, perhaps a little calm ahead. Some big news today, though, in the crypto space as federal regulators sued the world's largest crypto exchange, Binance, and and its CEO, Yahoo Finance's David Hollerith, here with more on this story. David, good to see you. What are we learning? Hey, Dave. So the CFTC is basically saying in this legal complaint um, that Binance and its co-founders C and CEO, CZ, violated U.S. federal securities laws by routinely offering crypto derivative products to American investors. Um, so to paraphrase uh, the lawsuit, what it said exactly, um, uh, I, I, you know, this quote comes from the CFTC's uh, chief counsel, Gretchen Lowe, and she said, you know, Binance's own emails and chat logs, which they had, had taken uh, possession over, reflect that Binance's compliance efforts have been a sham and Binance deliberately has chosen over and over again to place profits over following the law. So what's going on here is that Binance itself, um, there's Binance US, which actually does operate in the US, but Binance has not ever operated in the US. It's never been um, regulated by as a uh, US uh, entity, and it's routinely offered derivative or crypto-based derivative products to US investors. Um, so just some things from the, from the report or the uh, complaint that are worth pointing out. Um, is that, uh, you know, Binance has sort of uh, at least allegedly been dodging efforts since 2017, um, since the launch of its platform. And it's sort of calculated this as a way to <laughs> state that it's purportedly uh, blocking or restricting customers located in the U.S. and then sort of doing another thing. Um, one example was in August 2020, um, the CFTC alleges um, uh, citing documents and internal chat logs that um, Binance had about um, 
16% of its accounts from um, U.S. customers, and in August 2020 made about $63 million um, in total from uh, derivative, derivatives trading volume. Um, it also, in 2019, uh, made sort of a public show of reducing its, its uh, or, or trying to more actively uh, restrict U.S. customers. Um, and uh, then behind closed doors, it, what it seems is that um, there were, uh, the CZ, the CEO, informed um, Binance's uh, chief compliance officer to inform uh, other people in the company to sort of come up with ways to make it so that certain entities could still um, interact with the platform. Um, and in particular, you know, uh, what these entities are, they're, uh, by, they're named as VIPs or, or important traders, I guess. But, you know, these are probably institutions uh, from what we think, it, just given the amount of um, trading volume that, that's coming from these people. Um, that being said, they could be a, a massive individual that is literally responsible for, you know, influencing the crypto market in such a way. Um, but Binance's uh, ha ha response to this has been that it's unsurprising and disappointing. So not, not anything new, but definitely something that, um, we'll want to pay more attention to as regulation and lawsuits in the crypto space heat up. Indeed, keep us uh, up to date on this one. David Hollerith there with us, thanks so much. And Lucid Motors shares closing near the flat line today after the electric vehicle maker announced a recall on its Lucid Air. Senior Autos reporter Proz Romanian here with that story. Proz, what's the deal? Hey, how's it going, Dave? Yeah, so there's an electrical issue with about 640 Lucid Air EVs. What will happen is, is the electrical contacts, which is may kind of get stuck cutting off power, means the, the car would get stuck. Uh, now, Lucid says that what would happen is the motors would shut off, the car would coast to a stop, and you could restart the vehicle after shutdown, but not exactly a good thing when your car is in motion there. So, you know, only 6% of vehicles will be affected by it, so that's not that bad. The fix is a software update or potential replacement of these contactor switches. You know, bottom line here, we're seeing a lot of growing pains with a lot of EV startups and even regular EV makers here. We saw just now uh, that Ford, the Ford F-150 this month had a, or last month had a issue with their battery. Luce had a, had a, had a, had a, a wiring issue with their cars last year. And then also Rivian with a, a bunch of snafus here. Most kind of alarming was a, a missing bolt uh, on its suspension, front suspension arm. So, you know, these EV makers and even traditional automakers ramping up new EVs, it takes time. And also uh, there's a lot of little issues you got to keep, keep track of. Ross, another big story that you are following, or big story to us that caught our attention was in the watch world, and that's with the Rolex. Rolex really surprising people, I think, with an emoji watch debut. What can you tell us? <laughs> Yeah, Sean, the emoji watches here. A bit, a bit of a mixed reaction, but a lot of hype, right? So in Geneva at the Watches and Wonders trade show, Rolex debuted a new Oyster Perpetual Day Date model uh, that some have called the presidential uh, uh, watch. Now, this one has is Rolex saying it's called time stamped with emotion. What that means is that there's, instead of the date window, I'm sorry, the day window, they'll say words like happy, eternity, gratitude, peace, faith, love, and hope. And instead of the date number, will be 31 separate emojis that Rolex is using. So, in the, like I said, the watch world the kind of reaction is mixed. Some fans love the whimsy of it all. It's a fun thing to do. Others think it's totally out of left field. Like, who is Rolex catering to exactly? Is it just for the hype market, the hype watches, the TikTok and the IG views? We'll see. But bottom line, it's going to cost a lot of money and probably be very rare. Dude, I looked down at my calendar thinking it was April 1st because that looked like an April Fool's joke. Uh, we'll tweet out some, uh, some pictures of it that uh, just don't make sense. But, hey, we're talking about it, so they win. Pros, thank you. All right, coming up, Barclays remains bullish on Tesla. The analyst behind that call tells us why he believes the EV giant will pleasantly surprise investors when it comes to Q1 deliveries. That's next.
A bullish call on the street. Barclays reiterating its overweight rating on Tesla and $275 price target on the stock. Shares closing the day up just about seven tenths of a percent, just below 192 a share. We want to bring in the analyst behind that note, Dan Levy, Barclays senior autos analyst. Dan, good to see you. So you think that stock still has significant room to rally. So what's the catalyst on the dock? Hi, thank, thank you for having me, uh, Sean and Dave. Yeah, um, the, the call into uh, the deliveries role, result, which we expect uh, probably over the weekend, is that they're probably going to exceed expectations. We're forecasting 425,000 units of volume ahead of consensus 420,000 units. A lot of that is pegged to uh, some of the production commentary that they provided and some assumptions on how production fared uh, in March. And with the idea that you know inventory build is only gonna be modest. And so we think that it could be a positive event and a positive catalyst for the stock, which has been under uh, a little bit of negative sentiment lately, given some questions on demand. You expect additional price cuts. What about uh, impact on margins, Dan? Yeah, it, it, it's it's a very relevant question, and it's I would say uh, for for all automakers right now, the path to EV you're dealing with two questions. One is the ramp on volume, but it's also a question on margins. But I think the key point for Tesla is that because they have such a significant cost lead, um, it's it's only natural that they're going to use or lean into their margin advantage or their cost lead to unlock further volume. In fact, this was a key message that we got out of the investor day a few weeks ago, they are going to drive, try to drive costs down. And with that, they will unlock further, further volume. So it's, it's only natural that they're going to lean into the margins to unlock volume. So Dan, how big of a boost do you think potential further price cuts are going to be with demand? I know you're expecting 425,000 units for deliveries in the first quarter. What does the second quarter then potentially look like? There's going to be a, a ramp in volume going forward. And I, I think the key point I would make is that um, they are ramping on supply at some of their other facilities, right? So the question of, of price cuts, uh, it, it is natural just given some of the economic pressures that we're seeing. And we're seeing this broadly in the U.S. market, right? I mean, U.S. pricing as a whole for the U.S. industry is starting to come down off of all-time highs. So. Tesla is subject to the same sort of pricing dynamics that we see in the industry. On top of that, you also get some ramp in volume at their new facilities, the facility in Austin, the facility in Berlin. As more supply comes online, uh, it's only natural that they're probably going to cut prices somewhat to unlock that. I'll also point out that in the U.S. specifically, um, first quarter, there was potentially some pull forward of demand given the dynamics of the IRA. This is the uh, new legislation around the EV tax credit. Um, and there was some temporary uh, waiting period on when the full guidance is, is, is released. So in that time, they got full credit. There was probably some pull forward of demand. Remains to be seen what happens, but they're going to have more supply hitting. There will probably be some other price cuts, but just remember, there is some offset on the margins given additional fixed cost absorption, and also as raw mats are starting to uh, moderate somewhat. And Dan, there's always the Elon factor. An interesting heat map climate poll of 1,000 Americans showed that 36% said Elon Musk makes them less likely to buy a Tesla. And then there's the always present Twitter overhang that had quieted for quite some time. And as you know, it feels like it's very much back in the news. Is Elon a, a positive for the overall branding of Tesla? Listen, uh, Elon is is certainly uh, a, a core question. I I I go back to the notion though that um, it, for all the questions on on governance that that we've seen, and um, and this was something that emerged late last year, uh, this is still a company that has a leading product, leading cost, and they're going to use that to uh, to ramp on volume. Um, I think another message from the company also at the investor day, the reason why they had by the end of the investor day, 17 people on stage uh, alongside Elon was to show the, the depth of their, their bench. So yes, Elon is still uh, a, a critical factor here. He is the one driving the vision. Um, but I, I think the point is, is that there's more to Tesla than Elon.
Yeah, we've just never seen, Dan, an automaker with a polarizing CEO. So it's, it's unlike anything we've ever seen. In your sense, though, is, is he a pro? Is he a con? I, Tesla would not have done what they've done with, without, without Elon. So I, I don't think they would have gotten to this place. And, and there, there's a very fascinating history of Tesla that there were a lot of decisions that meant many of us, you know, myself included, questioned along the way. Um, look, Tesla would not have gotten to the point where they are taking some very unorthodox routes uh, without e Elon's guidance. So uh, yes, it's, it's certainly I can appreciate the fact that um, there are some questions on uh, you know, how Elon may be perceived and the, the Twitter overhang was certainly uh, a, a question, but I, I, I just go back to the product. Uh, it, it's, it, it has a lead. They have a clear cost lead. I mean, Tesla is doing 17% EBIT margin last year. If you compare that to some of the other automakers, I mean, it's, it's a clear lead over others. I'll just point out Ford, for instance, last week just reported that they had uh, negative 40% EBIT margins on their EVs. Uh, and while this is going to narrow, it's going to be a long path. And that's not specific to Ford. I mean, we're seeing that with, with others as well. The path to EV profitability is not easy. So Tesla has, has a lead in this regard. Yeah, certainly has first movers advantage there, at least for now. Dan Levy, great to have you. Thanks so much. Coming up, lots of buzz about AI at this week's Shop Talk event in Las Vegas. We are going to hear from Pinterest CEO Bill Reddy on how the technology is giving his company an edge next. country's major retailers from Foot Locker to Walmart are in Las Vegas this week for the huge annual industry event called Shop Talk. Yahoo Finance's executive editor Brian Sazi is there at Mandalay Bay in the center of it all. Hello Saz, who you got for us? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough life, but uh, somebody's got to do this gig, Dave Briggs. Uh, as for me, I caught up with uh, Pinterest CEO uh, Bill Reddy talking about uh, where he plans to take his business this year. He told me he wants to make the platform more shoppable. At the same time, he's also keeping an eye to all things TikTok. Well, so we have a lot that we've been doing to make all of Pinterest shoppable. Uh, and one of the new things we're talking about is how we're giving even more ways for people to rediscover the joy of shopping. The first 20 plus years of e-commerce is really about sort of instant buying, making the buying more seamless. 
I think the next 20 years of e-commerce is going to be about rediscovering the joy of shopping, how you walk the bazaar, how you, how you become inspired and discover. And this is already a natural strength for Pinterest, but we're doing a lot more to make the existing products on Pinterest shoppable. And now we're bringing features from our Shuffles app that let, lets people make digital collages, bring that right into our main app so that as people style outfits and pull together pieces from different, um, you know, uh, parts of outfits from different boards, putting those together into an outfit, and then making it so that others can shop each of those individual elements, or even see other collages and how other people may have styled those things, which again, really just gets more into the joyful part of shopping, the inspirational part of shopping, which really hasn't been solved in the digital world up to this point, but we think we've got a really great shot, of, shot at solving that. What inning are you in, in making Pinterest that go-to shopping destination? So, you know, it's interesting Interesting. The great thing about Pinterest is that more than half the people on Pinterest are there to shop already. So in a lot of ways, Pinterest solved digital window shopping, but all the stores were closed. You couldn't really easily take action. What we're doing now is making it so that all those stores are open. So we're making it so that all those things you find on Pinterest, you can easily connect to all the great places to go buy those. We're still relatively early in that, but as we've been bringing that in, we're seeing this really resonating with users. Uh, we talked about on our last earnings call, our shopping ads grew 50% plus year on year. Our mobile deep linking in shopping, which is what connects the user to a seamless checkout at the, in the retailer's app, that's now 40% of our shopping revenue. So as we're bringing these features into the app that make it so that people can easily take action on what they find in Pinterest, we're seeing that users really like it and advertisers are getting a lot of great benefit out of it. There's a lot of talk and you could feel it in the air here about AI. The sponsors are here for AI, everything is just AI and AI's having a moment. How does AI play into your future? Yeah, so we have a great foundation in AI. Our computer vision is what people would know Pinterest for really. Now as a consumer, the way you would experience that is when you come to Pinterest to walk that digital bazaar, you know, the recommendations, the visual experience of, of finding all the things that you're interested in through a great visual, whether it's a visual search or whether it's visual discovery, that's powered by really fantastic AI and computer vision. The interesting thing for us is that, you know, I think a lot of this discussion about AI has missed how important it is what signal the AI is acting upon. The AI, the AI is only as good as a signal that it acts upon. And for Pinterest, we have hundreds of millions of pinners that come to Pinterest every day and curate what a great outfit looks like, what a great room design looks like in a certain aesthetic. And we're able to have our AI act upon billions of interactions from pinners that make these product associations, which is very different than what you'd find on any other social media platform or really any other, any other shopping platform. How do you view AI as someone who's been in the tech industry for a long time? How do you see that evolving or the job market? How do you see it evolving the retail industry? Because I, I go back and, and think through a, a recent op-ed by Bill Gates, Microsoft founder, it was about a, a week ago, talking about superhuman intelligent AI. And, and it was a little scary, but how do you see it? Well, I mean, AI is definitely advancing quite rapidly and has been for, for some time. I think as we see this next generation of AI, it is really powerful. And so I think one of the most important questions out there is, what are people going to ask the AI to do? And are people asking the AI to do things that are positive and helpful? Things that are additive, which is where we're focused, is making sure that we're making really helpful recommendations for people that help them build a life they love uh, and connect that digital experience into their real world experience, whether it's putting together a great room, making a great meal for their family, putting together an outfit that's going to help them walk a little taller. These are all things that connect in their daily life. Uh, and so I think this question of what do you use the AI to do is going to be really important. And with us, we're making sure that it's additive to people's lives, not addictive, which I think has been one of the criticisms of some of what has happened with AI and social media uh, over the last many years, is that in a lot of ways it was becoming more and more addictive, uh, connecting you to things that make you engage for longer, but may not make you feel better after you engage with it. And us, we're really focused on how we lead to more positive well-being outcomes, uh, and we've had some recent research that we've released that actually demonstrates we're able to have that kind of impact, that we're actually able to make it so that when you engage on Pinterest, you feel more positive, you feel better after having spent that time on Pinterest. Well, speaking of addictive, and, and since we last spoke, TikTok has been on Capitol Hill, uh, really getting criticized for its business model. If TikTok was not in the U.S., what does that mean for Pinterest? So, you know, I can't comment on any one specific platform. 
I think with social media broadly, this question of you know, how do you make sure that it's additive and not addictive? How do you make sure that people feel better after having spent time with it is really important. And we think that's our role to play because there's been lots of research that has shown that as people spend more and more time on social media, they have rising rates of anxiety, rising rates of depression. People feel worse after having spent time there. And that very same research consistently shows that after spending time on Pinterest, people feel better after time on Pinterest. That's not an accident, that's intentional. We're tuning the AI, tuning our platform to be a positive place for people to be inspired, to discover, and intentionally saying, we want it to be a place where people can build a life they love and feel more positive. And again, I think this would be a really important question for social media broadly. Is it an uptick to your business though? Would you see, how should an investor think about it? Is it, do you see a user uptick if they don't exist? Well, you know, I think we're doing something completely different in social media than anybody else. The thing that is completely different about Pinterest versus the rest of social media is that the user's there with an intent and a purpose. With so much of the rest of social media, users are in a lean back entertainment mode. And the reason that shopping works so well on Pinterest is that people on Pinterest are there with a purpose. They're in a lean forward intent mode. And so that is completely different than the rest of social media. And the reason that shopping works there is because as you interject with something, if somebody's on a platform to watch a funny dance video or look at pictures of their friends and you try to interject something shoppable in that, that's sort of taking the user away from what it was they were trying to do, which I think is how much of social media would function. With Pinterest, the user, more than half our users are on Pinterest to shop. And so when we give them great shopping features, great things to engage with, we're seeing that they really like that, that they really engage with it. But again, that's because our, our platform is fundamentally different than the rest of social media and that users come to Pinterest with intent and purpose, whether it's shopping, redesigning a room, putting together a great meal, they're there with intent and purpose rather than just for lean back entertainment, which is what most of the rest of social media has, has historically been. Strange time uh, in the economy. Uh, banking crisis, it's been a, a weird few weeks. How has that impacted the ad market? You know, I think the broader market, you know, has been, uh, you know, going through a lot of change uh, for some time now. And, you know, this is more of that. The thing that we have seen is that as we've been able to give advertisers more measurability of performance on our platform, connecting more of the user's intent on our platform to actionability and making it so that advertisers can easily connect there, we're seeing that that's delivering really great performance for advertisers. So even in a shifting market, People are still advertising, and we think we can differentiate more and more through the high intent on our platform and through increasing the user's ability to take action on our platform, which then is not just great for the user because they're getting more of what they love, more of what they want to buy, but also great for advertisers too and creating really good returns for them. Has the ad winter thawed? <laughs> you know, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's continues to be choppy out there, um, but I think I've talked about this on our last couple earnings calls. Uh, in each of our last couple earnings calls, I talked about how even in a choppy market, we can still go take share. And I think that's what you've seen in each of our last two quarters uh, was that we grew faster than the broader market. Uh, so we're in a quiet period now. I have no comments about this quarter, but in each of our last two quarters, I've talked about how if we can do more to show great measurability, drive performance for advertisers as a 1% player in the market, there's still opportunity for us to grow even if that broader market may continue to be choppy. And you've seen, uh, really, Wall Street, I would say, come out this year in support of Pinterest and Bill Reddy. They like Bill Reddy, but ultimately, uh, to unlock value in Pinterest, uh, Bill and his team have to figure out how do you make this platform shoppable in that go-to destination. Uh, it sounds like he's working on it. Results to be, uh, to be determined. Yeah, it's really nice to hear him talk about Saws, the emphasis on positivity. It's almost like the Ted Lasso of social media platforms. Um, when you're talking to all these CEOs out there, how do you characterize the mood? Given the banking crisis and the tenuous time we're in, are they bullish about what lies forward or are they kind of in cutback mode? Well, on the positive note, uh, not hearing really any CEO, COO, CFO, even the stock analysts that I've talked to here, really sound the major alarm bell. Despite uh, this rolling bank crisis, and I think it's fair we can call it a crisis, we're not, I'm just not hearing that sales are falling off a cliff. I'm not hearing that consumers are now uh, out there in retail stores massively trading down. Now, 
What I would watch, if you are an investor in the retail space, is promotional activity. Uh, some of the analysts that I have talked to here on the ground saying uh, promotional activity has started to pick up ahead of the key spring buying season. Why do promotions pick up? Because some of the uh, store traffic may have started to tick down, not only in stores, but also online. Something to watch because with more promotions comes uh, just weaker profit margins. All right, Saz, so blackjack, crap, slots, what are you going to do? <laughs> Uh, I'm actually going to go back to my hotel room and write two stories. That's how I roll. Look I'm leaving that. the slots the for my dedication. next trip here. We got to produce stuff here at Yahoo Finance. The I'm here to produce does. and drive high ROI. There <laughs> high you go. ROI. There we go. He is a Saz wild man. He is the good. hardest working man in business is. news. Sazi, thank you. Great interview there. Coming up, the NCAA tournament has been a slam dunk for sports books. A lot of it has to do with Cinderella's like Florida Atlantic. Find out how next. Over the course of uh, of the tournament, we see more action than the Super Bowl collectively. So uh, this year will be you know, leaps and bounds ahead of any year pre prior and uh, even ahead of this year's Super Bowl. So really looking forward to it. That was Bet MGM CEO Adam Greenblatt just a few weeks ago telling us that March Madness was likely to be the biggest yet for sportsbook operators. Now with the final four set and no top three seeds remaining for the first time since 1979, the betting numbers appear to be playing out just as Greenblatt had predicted right here on Yahoo Finance. Well, Josh Schaefer is here with more on that story. Josh, and even looking into the numbers, how big of a home run has this tournament been? Yeah, Shauna, so I took a look today at New York because that's the best weekly numbers that we get, and you can see the numbers from the first weekend and when you take a look at New York we'll look we'll start with BetMGM specifically in their hold percentage so the hold would be what the gambling operator holds after paying out losses and promotions you can see it over doubled this year from about three percent a little over three percent last year to eight percent similar story at DraftKings DraftKings was around three percent and now up above eight percent this year as well now there can be a couple reasons for this one of them is we've seen the sportsbooks be successful at getting same game parlays and live betting more active. Gamblers are worse at those bets, so the house wins more. Also, it's been a weird year for upsets. Last year we had St. Peter's, which a lot of bettors were actually on St. Peter's and won a lot of money from that. This year, gamblers never really moved over to a lot of these underdogs, and so people kind of stayed on the top the top teams, and it didn't really pan out for them. I thought it was interesting. Research from Aquarius showed that the only day that uh, gamblers actually had a negative hold in week one was the Purdue Fairleigh Dickinson day. So that was Friday. 
So Fairleigh Dickinson, a 16 seed, became the second 16 seed ever to upset a one seed. And for some reason, the public liked that one. But then when you fast forward to Saturday, Sunday, when some of the less popular upsets happen, like Princeton moving on or even uh, FAU moving on, Betters just haven't been attracted to those upsets, so it's really working out well for the books right now. Yeah, all the futures bets were on the likes of Texas or Alabama or UCLA or even Duke. The top 10, Dave. Nobody. The top 10 bets at Caesar Sportsbooks were all number three seeds or higher or Duke. That was oh. all it was. So the futures bets are all out of the market now, essentially. People that bet before the tournament for a team to win, a lot of those bets are just gone now. Mm. including mine on Texas. So who's, <laughs> who's left, who's the betting favorite, and who's the underdog? Yeah, so we've got UConn, San Diego State, Miami, and FAU. And U UConn is the favorite coming in at minus 135 to win two games, which I should point out for those that don't gamble, that is pretty crazy price for UConn. Heavy, heavy favorite there. But you can see how those numbers have sort of come down. FAU was a plus 40,000 to win the national championship this year. That's your talking, you bet $10 and you can win $4,000 um, if you had bet on them at the beginning of the year. So no one's expecting these teams to be here. And so that's why the books are doing so well because pretty much no, not a lot of people bet on them before the year. Sometimes we talk about crazy upsets and you're wondering if the sports book is gonna lose a lot of money, right? Because a lot of people bet on them. There wasn't heavy volume on these teams. I don't know who you got, Dave. I'm going to go UConn. I know that's Well, that's a, a safety pick. It's a boring pick. There we but go. It's they not played. a good bet. There's no money to no, I wouldn't bet on it. Yeah. I might take them spread, though, in a couple of these games. They'll probably be uh, favored pretty heavily. But that's. I think they've played the best. they played great. I was in the Garden on Saturday. The FAU crowd was strong, I will say. They were fun. It'd be fun to see a 9 seed win. It would be very fun. Who do you think? Uh, look, I would certainly bet on UConn. I just wouldn't sleep on Miami. They've got three dudes, and Jordan Miller mm -hmm. will play in the NBA – Probably the most underrated player left in the tournament. It's just been wild. It's, I think it's been fun having the upsets. We've had too many. Well, now you wonder too if you're going to get... The are tickets are going to be awful. Well, I think yeah, the, the, the ratings could struggle. Is, is it going to be a bad game? Because you might get a blowout now when these... The finals yeah. will be a blowout. That I know. Miami or UConn. <laughs> you heard it here first. We'll yeah. see in a couple of days whether or not you are right. All right, Josh, thanks so much for yeah. stuff. Well, coming up, the Silicon Valley bank collapse continuing to send shockwaves throughout the startup world to see what it could mean for the equity gap when we come back. The impact of the Silicon Valley bank collapse is still reverberating across the entire economy, but among the venture capital industry, it will undoubtedly be significantly 
altered moving forward with markdowns of 25 to 30 percent, according to Bloomberg Intelligence. Could the VC racial gap, already at devastating numbers, also be worsened? Joining us now to discuss this is Frida Kapoor Klein and Mitch Kapoor, founding partners of Kapoor Capital and co-authors of Closing the Equity Gap. Nice to see you both. Uh, we want to circle back to that gap, but Mitch, want to start with you on the overall impact you're seeing on the VC industry as related to the Silicon Valley collapse. Well, I would say Silicon Valley Bank reflects both the best and the worst of tech culture. And I really think Frida has her finger mm -hmm. on how that is playing out. Well, it's playing out um, in a lot of blaming, a lot of finger pointing about who caused the problem. Uh, and it should be playing out in terms of an introspective look at the culture. The best parts of Silicon Valley Bank and the best parts of the culture, risk taking, innovation, understood the tech uh, ecosystem. The worst parts, insular, clubby, exclusionary. Frida, Mitch, either of you here, feel free to jump in. Just in terms of what you're hearing from your clients, from these startups, how worried they are about what just played out at Silicon Valley Bank, and also how that shaped some of the advice that you're offering some of your startups now. Well, there was a lot of panic a couple of weekends ago, and many companies realized that they hadn't had any guidance on treasury management. So one of our companies had all of their money in one Silicon Valley bank account, several million dollars, a non-interest bearing account. They had no banking relationship manager, um, and that was a startup with black founders. Uh, other of our companies that were more inside the club had a lot of guidance and a lot of help along the way. We have spent a lot of time helping our companies diversify their accounts. Um, a relatively small proportion of our startups were exclusively with Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, we're always available proactively to help them, help them think through their options, where to get their line of credit. Uh, but I do think people are quite worried. What does it mean? Is there another bank that's going to fall? Yeah, it is concerning. And again, for either of you, uh, was the VC community guilty of, if not illegal, guilty of some unethical behavior, pushing some of these startups to not just use Silicon Valley Bank, but to go all in with Silicon Valley Bank and then taking some rather generous kickbacks from the bank? Well, I was going to say that I think it is um, the elite VC firms push their companies to go exclusively with Silicon Valley Bank and require them to put all of their money there, the, the, the bank did in many cases, which is certainly not good policy. So I think it takes a long look. If VCs are really going to be supportive of their companies, they have to act in the company's interests and not just be clubby with the bank. Frida, when we talk about the fallout here, the SVB collapse, how do you see this or do you see this exasperating the equity gap that already exists right now? And according to some of the numbers that you sent over, less than 2%, less than 2% of VC funding goes to Latino or black founders. Yes, the numbers are shocking. The numbers have been poor for many years. After the murder of George Floyd, there was an uptick in the amount of funding, especially for black entrepreneurs. Uh, but with the downturn in 2022 for the whole market, the funding to uh, Latino-led businesses, Black-led businesses dropped, but it dropped even more significantly. So there's a 36% drop in overall VC dollars, but Black entrepreneurs saw a 45% drop in their funding. Mitch, why is that gap so wide and how do we lessen it? Well, I think... Silicon Valley likes to think of itself as a merit meritocracy, but in practice, it's really more of a meritocracy. Investors are looking to fund people who look like themselves, who went to elite schools. Our view is that what talent is often overlooked and underestimated, and that if you use a yardstick of what we call distance travel, meaning where did somebody start in life and how under their own steam have they overcome hurdles and obstacles, you wind up making a better set of choices about who to fund. And by the way, it's a more diverse set of entrepreneurs. Yeah, and you're, you're, you've been telling this story. You've also launched uh, Kapoor Capital here in terms of, the, you're really a pioneer when it comes to impact of investing and trying to address some of these issues that seem to 
not really see much improvement year after year after year. Frida, when you're taking a look at certain ventures that you want to be invested in, what, what is the guideline? What are some of those characteristics that you're looking for that come in place among many of the startups that you speak with? Well, as Mitch said, we're looking for distance traveled. We're also looking that the idea of their business came from their own lived experience. So we have many founders who, for instance, uh, Block Power, that's been in the news a fair amount, a Brooklyn-based company, uh, is doing uh, electrifying and decarbonizing buildings, especially in the urban core. Danelle Baird, that founder, grew up in bed and they used an open oven door as their heating source, dangerous and unhealthy. And he cares passionately about making sure that low-income families, communities of color, are on the front edge, not the back edge of solutions to climate change. Yeah. All right. We'll if I could add. Yep, go ahead. All the companies we invest in close gaps of access opportunity or outcome for low-income communities and communities of color. So that's our investment thesis and we have 150 uh, plus companies uh, on that. The book is Closing the Equity Gap. Mitch, Frida, really appreciate you both being here. Kudos to you. All right, Lyft making a change at CEO David Risher, who had been a Lyft board member since 2021 and previously held management positions at Amazon and Microsoft, will take over the role from Lyft co-founder Logan Green. The two co-founders, Green and current president, John Zimmer will remain on Lyft's board, but not participate in running the company on a day-to-day -day basis. Lyft up more than 6% in after-hours trading, but shares are down nearly 13% since the start of this year. Coming up, ChatGPT could be entering the workforce and possibly at your expense, according to a new study. Find out more next. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, all topics discussed heavily in tech in 2023. But now you've heard all the rumors, AI is coming for your job. It's gonna steal your family. It's gonna eat the food off of your dinner table. Folks, how much of this is actually true? Generative AI is here, it's in everyone's palms, and it's not going anywhere. To find out more, we went straight to the experts to discuss where technology meets culture and where the South met the Southwest. We're here at South by Southwest. We're here in the Lone Star State. We're posted up on what is the most musical part of Austin, Texas. Webster's Dictionary defines AI as the simulation of human behavior in computers. Sounds harmless, right? But with the exploding popularity of generative chatbots like ChatGPT, many people are re-examining where they stand on the technological food chain. Ian Beecraft is one of the leading voices in deep tech and AI. His company, Signal & Cypher, teaches large companies about how to adapt to new technology. Ian says, we've only scratched the surface of what AI can do. We are at the very beginning of one of the biggest revolutions in knowledge work in human history. And a lot of people look at this as a large step change in the way that we do our work. What we're doing is we're digitizing skills the same way that we mechanized physical labor in the Industrial Revolution. You're doing things at a scale, at a volume, and a breadth that human minds aren't really capable of. So will the rise of AI lead to job losses? And if so, why should we embrace this technology? We met with Gary Kasparov, the former chess grandmaster, famous for his series of chess matches against the 1980s supercomputer Deep Blue. Every new technology in the past threatened jobs, actually destroyed jobs, destroyed industries before creating new opportunities. So AI is not an exception. Machines made us stronger in the past, made us faster in the past. Many jobs we're doing today, yes, they, in my view, they are like zombie jobs. They're already dead, they just don't know it yet. Okay, so far, our experts have not painted a particularly rosy picture for the future of mankind, so we went directly to the source. You know what they say, keep your enemies close. According to ChatGPT, artificial intelligence has the potential to greatly impact the future of humanity in both positive and negative ways. On the positive side, AI has the potential to improve many aspects of our lives. That doesn't sound too bad, but it goes on. One major concern is that as AI systems become more advanced, they may become difficult to control, potentially leading to unintended consequences or even catastrophic outcomes. Therein lies the concern, and why many in the tech industry are approaching AI with a good deal of caution. People are getting freaked out that, hey, what is this thing? 
you know, can we trust it? I see both sides of the argument. And, you know, in some ways, there's a lot of opportunity. But on the other hand, we also have to be careful just with any technology. That was Polkit Agrawal, Assistant Professor of Computer Science at MIT. So instead of thinking about AI as a replacement for human beings, according to Polkit, we should think of AI as a tool. Like the invention of the PC, AI may actually improve our work and make humans more efficient in performing our day-to-day -day tasks. If an AI system can look at, say, you know, CT scans and make a diagnosis, is it going to replace a doctor or not? You know, I would say no. While the possibilities for AI may seem limitless, it could be the key to unlocking the potential of the human brain. The Terminator and Matrix and other things that brainwash the public. Machines cannot dream, so we should dream. Yeah. We should think how we can actually you know, cooperate with machines. It's, I believe there's the, 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 uh, the opportunities are absolutely endless. Artificial intelligence will impact just about everything we do moving forward. Researchers from OpenAI, Open Research, and the University of Pennsylvania, in fact, believe that up to 80% of workers could see their work tasks affected by large language models. The paper argues that mathematicians, accountants, and journalists are some of the jobs that could be impacted. The research also finding that higher income jobs may face more exposure to AI, Shauna. Yeah, and I think this is interesting because they're not saying that 80% of jobs are going to be displaced or no. totally eliminated because of AI, but you're going to have some portion of your work affected by AI technology. And I think the initial response is a lot of people will be very nervous about that, that headline, very worried about whether or not their job is going to be one of those that could potentially be eliminated. Yes, I think there are going to be a small number that are eliminated, but it could make you much more after the quarter year, much more efficient in terms of what you are doing. It, what they're saying, at least 10% of your work is going to be affected for those 80% that will have their job at least impacted in some way by AI. So 10%, you're still pretty needed in the yeah. rest of the 90% of whatever you're doing. And just to clarify some of these numbers, they add 19% of the population will have 50% of their work impacted. So that 80% only has the margins yeah. of what they do, probably the busy work impacted. Um, the question is, will you get paid less in the future because technically you might be doing less? 
I don't know. The, we have no idea where AI is going. It is evolving so much faster than any of us can perceive and analysts and investors can perceive. Just a guess? Yeah, I think people will, in some professions listed here, make a little bit less, but then again, your job will be more efficient, you'll have exactly. more time for it might be spending time with your family or finding a side hustle. Yeah, I was gonna say, or you're just going to simply be much more productive at your job, so you will then be responsible for more. So I think it will be a win-win here for companies just in terms of investing in AI, implementing those technologies within their business, and then getting more out of every employee. So hopefully, that doesn't mean pay will be cut, although I'm sure maybe that excuse might be used for some companies here as they no are question. looking to cut some costs. But I think AI, really what comes down to it is there's so much uncertainty, like you're saying, so much unknown, and that's really what is scaring people. And when you given the fact that there is so much unknown out there, you don't know what you can trust, what you can't trust, given the fact that when you talk about chat GPT, there's a lot of misinformation in some of the facts, some of the information that it does spit out. And I think right now we need to get a better handle on that before we see more widespread adoption. I don't know how realistic. And recently, is. misperception. There's no sarcasm, and it can't take yeah, sarcasm into account, which has you. really fooled a lot of people. Can we answer how many jobs will be completely replaced by AI? No, but undoubtedly, some significant number of our economy. There are jobs that you need to ask yourself if you're in college or just out of college. What jobs could potentially be completely replaced by AI? Because there will be those. So you need to think about that as you're planning your future now. That's frightening, but that's the reality. It's here, and it's only going to be moving faster and faster yeah. every day. And we've talked to expert after expert, and then most of them say, that it's going to f impact every single industry, Everything. which is crazy when you try to wrap your head around that fact. All right, well, it is closing time here at Yahoo Finance. Let's get you caught up on some of the biggest headlines of the day. Disney CEO Bob Iger saying in a memo this morning that the first of three rounds of job cuts before summer are going to begin this week. Now, the layoffs, which will amount to 7,000 jobs when all is said and done, are part of a broader effort to reduce spending and free up cash flow. First Citizen Bank reaching a deal to purchase Silicon Valley Bridge Bank, uh, renamed after the FDIC seized it on March 10th. Shares of First Citizen skyrocketing on the news that it would be purchasing $72 billion in loans at a discount of $16.5 billion, as well as SVP's deposits totaling $56 billion. And lastly, the CFTC is suing Binance and its founder over allegations that the company offered unregistered crypto derivatives in the U.S., knowing that it was against federal law. Now, the lawsuit filed Monday in the Northern District of Illinois alleges that Binance offered the products on cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, Tether, and the company's own tokens. All right, that will do it for Yahoo Finance Live today. Be sure to come back tomorrow, 3 o'clock Eastern time, for all your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. We'll see you tomorrow.